name, do affirm that I will preserve, protect, and defend the general welfare of the student body at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and its constitution and all laws enacted under its authority. Now, if everyone will please speak with me. The oath of office shall be, I do affirm that I will preserve, protect, and defend the general welfare of the student body at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and its constitution and all laws enacted under its authority. Thank you. Okay, apologies. We probably should have had that on the screen for everyone on Zoom, but um, since everyone probably already knows it by heart, hopefully you just went along with us. I guess you can just, I'll just let you know if it gets annoying once you hear it. I probably won't really need to tell you. All right, next item of business is um, if, uh, there is a motion to approve the agenda for today. So moved. So moved. There. Second. All right. Any objections? Okay. Okay, now we are going to move into open forum. So we will begin with Senator Anna Batorsky, uh, Senator from Biostatistics. Um, I have a slide here that she prepared. So if Anna, you can hear me over Zoom, and you would like to unmute yourself, you may go ahead and speak. Great, um, could everybody hear me? I think you can hear me, but I, I guess I can't hear. Yes, sorry, yes, okay, great. everyone can hear you. <laughs> great, um, yes, so I, hang on. I am no longer seeing the slides. I, I did not memorize what I wrote down, I'm sorry. Can you can you continue to share that on Zoom? Yeah, sorry. Okay, great. So, um, okay, so I um, I will try to be quick here, but I also kind of brought this idea up um, in the March um, meeting of last year. So, some students in my department um, are were asking our department if um, the department could fund in uh, professional level Overleaf accounts. Um, so Overleaf is a collaborative cloud-based LaTeX editor. It's used for writing, editing, and publishing um, papers, dissertations, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, other documents that are heavy in mathematical notation. Um, if you could, you can just put everything, everything up at once, it's fine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it partners with a wide range of scientific publishers to provide official um, journal LaTeX templates and direct submission links. And the, the paid professional accounts um, allow for unlimited collaborators on documents, um, richer editing, additional syncing for version control, and a lot of other wonderful features that I'm not going to get into right now. But I do have more information than I did in my uh, March uh, meeting, actually. So the link on this page will take you to a very detailed um, bit of information that the Overleaf rep um, sent to us regarding the features that um, Overleaf has, um, why the professional accounts are great. And then she was able to kind of bring up some metrics as far as the usage. Um, and so, because when you register, usually you register with your, um, your you know, university email, they are aware of about almost 1,600 registered users from the university. Um, <clears throat> the uh, mostly doctoral students in computer science, math, physics, statistics, economics, and, and biostat. <clears throat> excuse me, are um, the most common users. Um, she kind of priced out um, what it would cost for departments versus the university. And if it's gonna cost about $10,000 for a department-wide account, and you know, at least six departments are you know, using this pretty widely, um, you know, it kind of was economical to, to maybe um, push for the university to, to provide this software. 
Um, so again, the, the link below kind of has some more information about the software itself. Um, but I'm, what I'm kind of asking for is for um, senators from, you know, maybe some of these departments and some other departments. I know chemistry and biology were listed as some of the other departments that, um, that use this software. Um, just, you know, if you could just email me, uh, I think my email is the next bullet point down there. Um, yeah, great, thank you. Um, you know, if you'd be willing to help me, um, you know, just kind of sponsor this initiative, um, we're hoping to maybe talk to the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research um, and see if they might be willing to um, pay for this software for the university. And it's not just for students, it would be faculty, staff, um, so it would benefit everybody. And the, our department, our student organization in biostatistics is uh, planning, we don't have a date yet, but we're planning on having a LaTeX Overleaf um, seminar, like an intro on, as to how to use the software. So um, thank you for your time. Hi, Anna, this is uh, Nick Melosi from Health Policy and Management. I have a question for you regarding, is this just in addition to the current Microsoft stuff that we have available? Is this better? Does it provide a, a better service? I guess what I'm wondering is like, what's what's the biggest benefit of this um, using LaTeX over what's, a, you know, either currently available or, you know, is this something that's much better and that we should all be on it? You know, I can't really speak personally to like what is better necessarily. I just know that um, it is pretty widely used. Um, I personally will benefit from a seminar on this because, you know, this, this is probably how I'm going to publish my dissertation papers because um, that's what most other folks in my department use. I know that a lot of people use free accounts. There are a lot of benefits to the paid account as far as compared to other software. I may not have the details myself, but some information might be in that document if you um, if you want to look into that, or if you have other specific questions as to like how this might be better than other available software, I could probably find that out if you want to send me an email. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I just I know the econ classes I've taken, I've seen LaTeX used a lot, so you know I, I just was curious to know what was the benefits, but yeah, I can take a look at the document. Thanks. I'm sorry, we are now at time for this presenter, so we'll have to move on to the next open forum presenter. Sorry, I don't think anyone on Zoom heard me. Um, I just mentioned that the PDF that Anna is referring to is in the Heal Life folder, so you can check that out. And uh, Tim, I did see your hand raised, but unfortunately we have to move on to the next speaker. So hopefully you can email Anna with any questions. Okay. And I do not have slides for the other two speakers, but next up is Noah Lyman, Senator for Economics. Um, I'm not sure if you are here in person. Oh, all right, you can go ahead. Hey everybody, uh, Noah Lyman from Economics. Um, so I'll be really quick. So I serve on the Finance Committee and one of our objectives of our last meeting was to kind of float the idea of establishing an ad hoc committee to review the university budget. Um, so the university has roughly a $4 billion budget for this academic year. And the objective for this committee would just be to kind of look it over and see if there are any areas where we can reallocate money um, and send it towards us grad students. Um, so I, that, that's all I had to say. I don't know if any of my fellow committee members um, want to follow up. But. All right. Thank you, Noah. Um, I know that the finance committee will go over a little bit, I think, about that. Um, so you can ask them more about that during their updates or follow up with them afterwards um, or with Noah if you have any questions. All right, and so the last Senator who is speaking today is Abig Abigna, I think I saw you here. Hi, Hi. Um, Abigna from and Health Behavior. Sorry, just quick note. Um, it might be a little hard for people on Zoom, so if you could just try to speak as close to your microphone as you can. Sorry, thank you. 
Hi, I'm a big note from Health Behavior, round two. Um, so I'm just going to make a quick announcement about the All the Essentials Task Force. Um, this is an external appointment, and for the, those of you who may not know what this is about, um, it's basically a collaborative, university-wide um, group that brings together people from campus offices, like the Dean of Students and Student Life, um, as well as students from um, organizations like GPSG, RHA, et cetera. Um, and the goal is to create like a comprehensive basic needs um, program for UNC students. Um, and we do that by like centralizing essential resources and support services. Um, and I'm one of, if not the only GPSG reps for this task force. And I recently spoke with one of the co-chairs um, of the task force and there are potential additional opportunities for students to get involved. Um, so meetings haven't started yet. Um, so we are looking for more partnerships with other student organizations, um, specific partnerships with the Gilling School of Global Public, Public Health. So if you are in organizations that are connected to the greater student population or you are in Gillings and are passionate about student advocacy, um, I just wanted to say, please come and talk to me after the meeting or maybe even just send me an email so that I can get you connected with Ali and we can kind of get you into the group because we are looking for more connections. So that was all, thank you. Thank you, Abigna. Um, in my follow-up email to you all, I will put the names and the emails of all of these three senators if you would like to reach out to them. All right. All right, um, so this slide is wrong. Right now we are going to hear some updates from the student body, President Teddy Van, who has joined us today. Hello. Yes. Great. yes. Hello, nice to meet all of you. Um, I'm Talaja Teddy Van. I'm our student body president and the undergraduate student government president this year. I didn't really get a chance to like connect with each of you before the meeting got started, um, but I did want to, first of all, make this brief because I know you said you want your meeting to not run super duper long, but also just begin by saying this is your second Senate meeting, your first one I missed. Um, during the campaign, I don't know how many of you were like paying attention to that, but something I said during that period of time is that I'll be at every graduate and professional student government Senate meeting. I didn't know when your first meeting was, but the burden's on me to know when it is and to be there. So just want to apologize to all of you sincerely for not making the time to be in that space and to thank you for allowing me to be in the space now, but also to let you know that I'll be at all of your meetings moving forward uh, to the best of my ability. Just to give you some quick updates as far as what's happening in undergraduate student government, and we're working on getting our major programs underway. I know some large things we're working on this year are the REAL program, which is a first-year leadership opportunity. Um, applications for that are opening up soon. We're also working on the Distinguished Lectureship, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about later. But beyond those larger programs happening in the Office of the President, just assisting our six cabinet departments and getting their events out over the course of the semester. I know there's a mental health resource fair that we recently approved a submission for and a voter registration event. Mostly our different cabinets are just figuring out what any member of our student body wants to see and creating um, opportunities for them to get to engage with us. We just had our Board of Trustees meeting last week, and that was a, a fruitful experience. Theodore was there and got to give what I thought was a really great presentation on the need for grad student stipends to be raised, and I've had some conversations with our board members about that as well. Um, and so that was just a helpful part of BOT. An update on um, associate student government. We had, as a university, a full delegation um, present at ASG in their last meeting, which is a rare thing, something we haven't been able to do in like the last year, just not great attendance. Um, not only did we have a full delegation, but there was representation equally from grads, government, and undergrad, and so that was something we're really proud of as well. Um, and then just an update on that lectureship I mentioned to you all, it's something I've discussed with Theodore a little bit already, but ultimately wanting to have the distinguished lectureship that student government pumps a lot of resources in this year to be something that's a lot more student focused and based in the arts, but it's really important to us to make sure that it's something that draws the attention of undergraduate students as well as grads. Um, and so want to continue to collaborate with your government and making sure that the funding that we've got set aside for the lectureship is spent well. Um, we've got tens of thousands of dollars right now set aside for a speaker to come to this event. And so it's really important to us to make sure that it's a speaker that would draw you guys from like this side of campus to actually come to like the Great Hall and actually participate in the event. So I'm um, excited to continue to work with you on those things. And then just as a final note, 
there's a Calendly link that's been shared with the undergraduate senate already for one-on-one -on -one meetings they can schedule with me. I'm going to get that link shared to you all. I'm sure Theodore can let me know who to send it to, but I really hope that you all will use it. It's just like 15, 20 minute slots for us to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one so I can get a chance to get to know you better and hear more about the issues affecting your constituency. Thanks. And just if you have any questions, I'm available for them. Thank you, Teddy. Does anyone have any questions for Teddy at the moment? All right, if you would like to reach out to her, I will provide her email in the follow-ups. Thank you. All right, and our first uh, updates from GPSG will be from President Theodore Noller, if you have met him before. It's fine. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, I'll try to make it snappy. Time is of the essence. Um, one thing I want to draw to your attention is that we have a meeting with the provost and the vice chancellor for finance on October 18th, uh, at which they're going to answer questions about uh, how the budget works, how we're going to fund raises to the grad stipends and other issues. Uh, Noah suggested something that I think we will formalize later in the meeting, an ad hoc committee to review the budget. Uh, I hope if any of you are interested in uh, finding the money that we want to direct to other things that you'll volunteer for that committee. Uh, uh, because it'll mostly be done by the 18th. So we're going to sprint to that. Um, it's really important that we have a large turnout for that because if we don't, then they're going to think that we're not serious. They don't have to listen to us. If we have people in the room, even if you have no idea what's going on, it makes it look to them like grad students care and like getting a raise and improving career services and professional development actually matters. Um, so if you can't come, please find other people from your department to come. We want a full room. Uh, that That's the first step in uh, getting what we need. Uh, thing two, we have a sponsorship from Brandwine's Bagels. They're going to give us discounts so that I can come and meet normal people in your department with you and learn from them directly what it is that we should be doing. Um, I just want to provide that uh, free stuff so they have some incentive to come and talk to you and me. Um, so I have a Calendly link that you can find uh, on the slide or you can email me. I'd love to set that up. Um, I think it's a big part of the job is to just talk to people and not play inside baseball. So uh, please help me meet the people in your department so that I can figure out what their problems are and solve them. Um, real quick, anybody who wants it, uh, I'm going to give you my phone number so that you can email me whenever, but you can also text or call. Um, it's 405-824-3998. Happy to give it to you again later. Um, you know, if I'm awake, I'll answer you. If I'm not awake or if I'm dead, I won't answer you. Um, I did speak at the BOT. We can talk about that later. I don't, I mean, I just said pay us more money and gave them some data. And then they said, uh, okay, so we're reading the details on that. Uh, um, the, the number they're quoting right now is 20,000 for the minimum stipend. We'd like to see it be 25, which is part of why we're trying to get your help uh, connecting to people in your units so that we have an organized plan and a workforce that we can use to make serious requests about that. Uh, there are other opportunities or options, different numbers. There's room for negotiation. So if that's interesting to you, terrific. If you're a professional student, we're working on uh, improving career services at the university and trying to keep tuition from rising a ton higher. They do want to raise tuition for all grad students this year. If you care about that, please talk to me. Um, I got permission from the vice chancellor of finance for us to take $50,000 and endow a fund for GPSG travel awards and emergency fund. We have restricted money, fee money that we're not allowed to use for that purpose. We will essentially, is this being recorded? Okay, we will, uh, we will trade it for utility money. We are not money laundering it. I want to be very clear about that. Um, we have, it is, it is legal and we are going to do it uh, if you guys want to, but you have to vote. It's not like I go and do this and then come back and say surprise. Um, it's up to you if we do that or not. So I can answer questions about that if you have them at any point in time. Um, the last thing that I want to, the last two things I want to say are that we have a stipend survey. That's because we don't know what the average stipend is and UNC says they don't know either. Um, so we're trying to collect that information manually. If you can help us, that would be great. Uh, and then the fun thing is that we're having a watch party for the Carolina Duke football game. Uh, that is at 8 PM on a weekend, but it's a great chance to meet people and there will be free food. So even if you are not interested, please pass that on to some of your constituents so that they can make friends if they're feeling lonely or they can just have a good time if they like to have a good time. Uh, that covers my remarks. Happy to talk to any of you at any time. And I'm gonna hand the mic back to Elena now. We have two minutes for questions now.
sorry, my name is Nate from Cell Biology and Physiology. Um, what was the date of that meeting you said we should be there? I don't recall. The it. provost meeting? Yeah. That's at October 18th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, it's capped at 90 minutes. Where? Uh, that will be in Chapman uh, 201. Kendall, I, I see your hand raised over Zoom if you would like to unmute and speak. Yeah, hi, uh, Kendall Winter Musicology. I had a question about the stipend survey. I went to fill that out recently and I noticed that it doesn't specify whether you're interested in pre-tax or after-tax numbers on stipends. I know for in my case, what it looks like my pay is annually on my paychecks is about $6,000 higher than what my take home is. So do you have a preference for how people specify that on the survey? Pre-tax. Pre-tax, okay, great, thank you. Okay, next, Carr, I see uh, your hand raised on Zoom if you'd like to mute yourself. Hi, I'm Har. Um, sorry, I'm driving, that's why I can't turn on my camera. But I, my question for uh, Theodore is, because for the professional students, like since we don't get stipend and stuff, like how do you want us, our representation to be beside uh, decreasing? Because that's, that's something that, a question that uh, a lot of my constituents had, that since we don't get stipend, like what really do we get from um, student government this year with like, beside uh, stopping tuition from raising? Because it seems like we don't have much of a say in that. Uh, I think the answer is right now, you don't get much at all from student government. And if you'd like me to come over and meet your constituents so they can give me an earful about what you need, uh, I'm happy to do that and give them bagels and coffee at the same time. I'm sorry, we're now at time. We will now have to move on to the next executive update. I'm sure Theodore will make himself available afterwards. If Harsh will please come forward. Excuse me, sorry, Senior Vice President, go ahead. All right, just really, really quickly here. Um, I had a couple questions about this, so I just wanna reiterate that uh, in order for your unit to remain in good standing and receive allocations at the end of the year, as a unit, you must attend six out of the eight Senate meetings. Um, we also have the social gathering requirement, but we will go over that at another time. But I just want to reiterate that you need to attend at least six of those meetings. Um, I will send this out also in the follow-up email, but each senator must fill out an information form. Um, I had about 66 submissions, but we need more of those. So just as a reminder to fill that out, it's very short. And then um, another thing is because this has been requested to know uh, updates from cap from cabinet members, as well as members from the executive board, uh, we are uploading monthly reports from all of those members in the document folder on Heal Life. So um, you can click on the, oh, I think that's for the form. Yeah. Um, so if you go to the document on Heal Life for today, you can see all of those full reports. And now we will hear from our VP of Finance, Harsh. Actually, does anyone have any questions for the Senior Vice President? We do have two minutes for questions. Seeing none, we'll move on to VP Harsh. Okay, so at finance level, we have been working with SFAS and reviewing different student fee that goes to different bodies. There are several two hour long meetings that we will be attending and seeing what increases have been proposed and we'll be going through them. Usually, I mean, from what we have seen so far, there hasn't been any significant increase in different component of tuition fee, but we will see when they're formally presented to us. Apart from that, we have been working with CUAB. We had a meeting with the board of directors and we discussed what kind of programming they're doing for grad students. You will hear some more updates about it soon, uh, what we are thinking about that. We had a comptroller, which was a great, great thing for us. So most of our pending disbursement for our emergency fund and travel fund, they are now in process. But if you hear from anyone who said, oh, an award was committed to me, but I have not received it, please do direct it to us. Either we have some missing documents from them or it is just stuck with business office, but we will try our best to resolve that and get the money to those people. 
There is some reallocation of uh, budgets that we will hear about soon from the committee, I guess. It's on, it's on you? Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, out of that, um, 50,000 is being proposed for an endowment fund that you talked about, which I personally feel is a great idea. GPSG having an endowment fund that can give recurring uh, year by year money to people who need it. I think that's brilliant. And then we can keep on adding to that endowment fund. Uh, we are working on our operating budget, which will be very, very precise and detailed. And uh, I think we have made some progress, but there is some confusion and we are working with business office to resolve it. And by next Senate, you should be able to see uh, the whole budget and you should be able to see from what line item, how much money has been spent versus how much is left. I think that's a great way for you to know how much money is left in which bucket so that you can plan your projects and you can say, hey, this money is left. Maybe we should reallocate or maybe you have a project in mind. So our goal is to spend all this money. So like Theo said, we have not all actually, we have to leave some in reserves, but we have 200 plus uh, 160 is what is our projected income from the student fee. So that's a total of 360 and we want to spend most of it. So this operating budget will give us a sense of where we are. Technically we are already in October. So this semester half is gone. So we'll have to be quick in spending this money. Otherwise we will end up with undergrad government who have a lot of lot of money they need to get rid of, but can't. Okay, thank you. We thank have two you. minutes for questions. Thank you, Harsh. Any questions for Harsh at the moment? All right, we will move on to our last update from uh, exec and hear from VP of communications, Kat. Hi, I will try to make this very quick. Uh, first thing, if you haven't already subscribed to our calendar, please do. I've sent you the link. I can send it again. Second, if you have upcoming events or announcements or anything you would like me to share on the website, social media, or in our newsletter, please submit that through the form. Currently, that form is under the newsletter tab on our website. I'm in the process of moving it to our homepage, so it'll be easy to find. If you are unable to find that form or have any questions, feel free to email me, but this way it's easier for people to submit the events. Second, or third, we have a couple of upcoming things. I've included them in our newsletter. Um, and so I highly recommend that you look through the newsletter and see if any of those things uh, pertain to your constituents. And I uh, encourage you to kind of push people to go do those things. For example, our watch party. We are also uh, collaborating with QAB on Wednesday, I believe, so that people can get free food at Linda's. So I highly recommend that you look at our newsletter, scan the little QR code that has social events, and encourage people from your department to go and get involved in those things. Are there any questions? Oh, wait. Okay. Two minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, my question is uh, that it turns out that the Linda's thing is October 13th from 6 to 8 p.m. and they've reserved, I think, $250 worth of free appetizers for whoever goes. So if you and your friends want to meet people from other programs, there's free apps, but we can't buy you beer because that's illegal. This information is all in the newsletter. Please read the newsletter. <laughs> Any real questions? <laughs> Any real questions, not comments? All right, we will move on. All right, um, so we do not have any of the cabinet directors who are making updates today. Celeste, who is the director of local relations, just wanted me to provide this slide here for reference because it just has some information um, about an upcoming meeting in a couple of days. If you would like to attend, feel free to email her if you would like some more information. And as I mentioned, Full monthly reports, though, from all cabinet members are in the HELI folder if you would like to take a look at those. I'd like to move to move the standing committee updates to after legislation. Second. Any objections? None? OK, great. All right, we will move on to legislation right now. We have 10, I believe, pieces of legislation. So we will try to move through them pretty quickly. All right, 
And just a reminder, you, uh, reminder, you do need to vote in order for your attendance to count. So please visit that link. And at the end, when we open up the uh, voting, um, please vote. Okay, and all legislation is uploaded to the HeLife, so if you would like to um, look at them, you can go there. And okay, all right. Our first piece of legislation is um, the Yates Appointment Act. So. Is Meredith Yates here today? Yes, hello. Oh, the legislation, uh, the, the voting will not be open right now. So, yeah, but you just go to the GPSG page on Heal Life and it will pop up there. Yes, she's over there. All right, um, Theodore, if you would like to present this bill. Great, um, Meredith is my candidate for Solicitor General. Meredith has a, she's a 3L, um, she's clever and willing to do the job and has some impressive stuff lined up after her time here at Carolina. I think a couple of federal clerkships are in line. So um, as Joshua Bikita put it, she's about as close to a superstar lawyer as we we're ever likely to have volunteer for this role. Um, that's my pitch. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Meredith Yates. I'll keep it brief because I know that time's of the essence. I'm a third year law student. Like he mentioned, I'll be clerking after graduation for a couple different federal judges. For some reason, I found myself with a lot of free time in my last year of school and being the legal nerd that I am, I thought it would be really fun to come here and learn Robert's rules, which apparently no one likes. But I think it's interesting and I'm interested in learning more about them. And I'd love to serve this community in any way that I can. Any questions for Meredith? Hi. Hi, uh, Kat Selna, Microbiology and Immunology. Uh, my question is in regard to your role as Solicitor General. Um, so that involves reading a lot of the codes and understanding our legislative documents, and a lot of times collaborating with committees where who review those documents. Will you have the time or are you willing to uh, able to meet with those committees when they are reviewing those documents to be able to provide input? Yes, absolutely. Because law school is very front heavy, um, I feel like I have more free time than I've ever had before in my last year. So I'm happy to meet with committees. I've actually already taken on a role as counsel in a Supreme Court case for the undergraduates because the undergraduate sister general was um, conflicted out. And that was optional, but I feel like I have the time to do it and I have the time to do what other responsibilities are needed for this job. Any other, sorry, any other questions <laughs> right now? All right. Are there any motions? Are there any motions right now to be made? Uh, move to approve the nomination. Second. So, all right, we'll go ahead and then move on to the next piece of legislation. So, um, as since we do the voting officially on here. So, is it is it open now? No. Okay. So, just a quick note for, um, in general, just if you would like to make a motion for any of the other legislations, um, if you would like to make a friendly amendment, that's something like an an example. If you see anything that needs to be edited or something like that. Or if for some reason you don't want it voted on, you can also move to view it at a later time, but I don't recommend it because then we have to do it later. Theodore. Yeah, so you don't have to motion to approve. If we hear no motions, we'll just move on to the next piece of legislation so we can keep things moving quickly. All right, and our next piece of legislation is the Travel Awards Improvement Act. Um, Theodore, if you would like to introduce this or uh, any of the other senator sponsors on this bill. I cede my time to Nick Melosi. Uh, yeah, I was going to say point of order. I thought the 53008 is next on the ballot. That is correct. Um, I don't know who put Theodore in charge of. Oh, that was already open. I didn't do it. All right. Our next piece of legislation, thank you, is an act to institute clerical revisions in the Code of Graduate and Professional Student Government. Um, would any of the sponsors like to introduce this bill? This bill fixes typos. 
Are there any questions for the sponsor? Just just to add a little bit more information to that. Um, <laughs> so if you could scroll down, Theodore, please. How far? Uh, just keep going. So just from uh, previous legislations that have been approved in the other Senate sessions, um, just a lot of things have not been updated yet in the code. So we have compiled them all into this piece of legislation. So these are just all clerical things like typos or words that need to be replaced and things like that. Um, hopefully you got a chance to look at it beforehand. And if no one has any questions, we will just move on to the next piece of legislation. Motion to end discussion. That's basically saying, <laughs> Elena, shut up. <laughs> Uh, do I hear a second? Seconded. Seconded. No. All right. No. Uh, any objections? Hi, sorry, Nate from Cell Biology. Okay, may I may I hear the eyes in the room? So, so sorry, clerical. Thing. So there's been an objection to the motion to end discussion. We will now vote on whether we end discussion or not, and we'll do that by a voice vote. So do I hear the eyes in the room? Just say aye if you want to end discussion. Aye. Aye. Am I allowed to explain why I want to? Do I hear any nays in the room? Nay. I withdraw my motion. Nice. OK, um, you may go ahead and speak. Thank you. Um, so we were just, I didn't notice this either until just now, but in section three, title one, uh, effect is changed to effect. And then when we scroll down to. Uh, yeah, so I'll clarify on this. Effect is changed to effect, effect and then back again. No, another no, spot. It's changed Look back. Page five, yeah. On page two, it's. So, so page five switches it one way and page two actually switches it back. So appendix A, we are not, those changes have already been voted and approved. So we have to actually correct the already made change and that's why it appears in two places. Um, so great eye for catching that, but yes, we've, we've considered that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, quick question, I see Kendall raising her hand if you would like to speak. Uh, yes, hi, uh, sorry, let me get my video going. Uh, is it on? Okay, hi. Kendall Winter from Musicology. Um, I understand what's happening with this bill um, being things that have already been voted on and we're just putting them all in one place so that it's easier to actually enact the changes that have already been passed. Um, I noticed that in the, um, uh, if you, excuse me, whoever's running it, if you could scroll down for us to um, the big chart regarding uh, travel award cycles, Appendix C. I just noticed that um, some of the language in here, thank you, in that rightmost column is going to be um, not consistent with legislation, or excuse me, with language that is proposed in uh, another piece of legislation coming up on the agenda later tonight. So I wonder if we might um, entertain an amendment to bring those two pieces into alignment. And when I mean pieces, I mean this uh, 5308 and 53. Uh, 012, which is the Travel Awards Improvement Act. Thank you, Kendall. Um, quick note. So since uh, this Appendix C has already been approved from previous, previous Senate session, we recommend that you motion for an amendment to um, Bill 53012. Okay. Good. Then I'll uh, put a pin in that until later. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Are there any other questions about this piece? All right, seeing as there are none, we will move on to the next piece of legislation. So 53009, this is the CAA Officers Act um, and Senator Joshua Bikita, if you would like to present this. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, this is just a clerical bill. This is really quick. Um, the Joint Code of Student Government, which governs relations between undergraduate student government and graduate student government, requires us to approve the board members of the Carolina Athletics Association, or CAA. Um, this is technically responsible for student ticketing policies and relations between athletics and students. Um, we uh, essentially, we have to approve, if we, even if we disapprove this, the Joint Governance Council 
can override it. So I mean, we should just approve this. These nominees have already been put forward. Um, and essentially, this is sort of a clerical thing that is a vestige of some old policy that hasn't been gotten removed. Thank you. Any questions for Joshua? Um, just uh, Nick Melosi, HPM. Just a quick one uh, for you, Josh. On page one, line seven, it, it should just read confirmed by the GPSG Senate, not the GPS Senate. Um, so actually, Nick, that is purposeful. So it, if you if you spell it out, it's graduate and professional student government Senate, which is repetitive. You just say you don't say like U.S. government Senate. You say U.S. Senate. Um, and so this is actually the language that is used in the Constitution. But great catch. We've had that come brought up before. Thanks, Josh. Joshua does not make mistakes. Any other questions for Joshua? All right, seeing as there are none, we will move on to the next piece of legislation. Um, this is great. So this next one is uh, the external appointments charter. So it's basically, well, I'll let Theodore introduce it if you would like. Uh, so one of our jobs is to appoint members of committees around campus who do various things, like uh, examples, Ackland Art Advisory Committee, the Calendar Committee, the uh, Advisory Committee to various deans, so on and so forth. We're uh, fortunate to have people who fill those roles. This, I'll scroll down for you. Um, they go through interviews with my chief of staff, Emily Urey, uh, who is incredibly sharp. Uh, so she's highly trustworthy. Some of them are appointed by other people. For instance, Samantha appoints people to the... Um, student advisory committee to the chancellor or whatever, but we have application processes for these. This is the result of that process. Um, you're welcome to look at the long thing. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Theodore. Any questions for Theodore? And just to add something to this, so there are two external appointments that um, we do need some more uh, students to fill. I think I have that in the announcements, so I will include that in the email. If you could share that with your constituents, um, that would be great so that we could get those filled up. All right, so the next piece of legislation, 53011. This one is uh, the travel awards from uh, this past month. So if uh, any of the senders would, or actually, Nicholas, would you like to introduce this? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So. Um... So this cycle, we had a total of 44 applications for these uh, travel awards. Uh, we blindly reviewed the applications that we received, you know, and within that, we awarded eight of the applications funding. Uh, it was between partial and full funding for some of them, and you know, the committee took a look at where they were traveling, what they had mentioned in their essays. Um, and so with that, we then awarded eight of them. So we currently spent 2,800 of our budget. Uh, we're looking forward to getting more money so we can award more awards to people. As of right now, we're on track to have not necessarily as many, but still a good number of applications reviewed for the next cycle. So if we can get more funding for it, we can try and you know award more people per month on it. Um, with that, I would just recommend uh, senators when you're communicating with your constituencies, Please make sure you tell them, look at the grading rubric, which is on the Travel Awards website when they're applying for the grant. Um, that was a common issue we ran into with a lot of these where key portions of the application did not have the, um, the mentioned subjects within the rubric. So due to that, people score lower. Um, and that's something that really, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's a quick clerical revision that if they just looked at it, they could do. So with that, uh, I think the applicants that we have awarded to were excellent applicants. Um, and I look forward to sending them travel money. Thank you, Nicholas. Does anyone have any questions for Nicholas? There, um, is there a motion to extend speaking privileges to VP um, Harsh, who has raised his hand? Uh, so moved. And a second? Uh, Harsh. OK, I just want to ask, like, people whom we don't award, do we reach out to them and let them know that they have not been awarded? Because there's like a lot of, and it's a complicated process in general, of course, because you have to first apply, then you get, then you travel, then you reimburse. And we get a lot of emails here and there. So do we notify them that? you were not given the support and this is the reason probably this happened and can they apply again 
if you like you said there was a portion missing so that's what we do in emergency fund sometimes that if you feel like there was not enough information we invite for information and then we assess it so two questions there right? yes no and i think those are excellent questions harsh so we um after we have uh, graded them, like I said, the process works that they are blindly graded by four members of the committee. Those grades are then, you know, taken in. We discuss the applicants. Um, based upon that, then we then either make the decision to move them on to the ballot, which is the eight that we have presented here, or they are then denied the application. I don't think that we give each and every one a detailed breakdown of why they individually didn't get it, and sometimes it's a mix between either their application was just missing significant portions of that like and like i said that is on the travel website it has been on the travel website for as long as i can remember it being on the travel website it's on the front page i think it's somewhat of their responsibility as well to take a look at that so when we review them if an individual contacts me individually i'll generally discuss with them some of the merits of it i had one who did that and i was you know pretty frank with them that they were just missing key portions of it and it sounded like they were unaware that there was the rubric on the site that they were being graded upon. So I don't think in this case here where we had 30 something applications that weren't you know, given, I'm not gonna give a detailed write out for individually why each one didn't get it. Um, but if someone does contact me with specific questions, I generally try and give them, I don't wanna tell them exactly everything that went through the committee process. I think that's probably a bit too much, but I try to give them a ballpark of what happened and why they didn't receive the funding. Sometimes it's just a function of, they wrote an excellent application. We just you know, didn't have the funds to actually award them that because like I said, we have a $25,000 total budget. We're currently, for this last cycle, we operated with $20,000 from the previous cycle. So you know, we have to be a bit strict on what we are actually able to give out. I would, personally, I would love to fund all of the travel awards if I could. Sadly, I am unable to. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see your name tag. I need, a, I need a... It's Ishan. Yes, Ishan, sorry. Hi everyone, Ishan Fudke, Economics. I just had a follow-up question for you. If we talked about earlier, there might be some more money coming through the Travel Awards Committee. If that goes through, would you be willing to maybe, if because you were operating on a limited budget before, but now it might be expanded, would you be able, able, is that something that you're able to do to go back on some of the applications that you've declined? I would love to. The problem that we run into is that we also have a large amount of applications that come in starting in January. So we would in some sense be, this is the toughest part of travel is, is that I would love to fund everyone now if I could. However, the problem is, is I could potentially be taking funds away from individuals who will be applying at a later date for conferences. And you know, due to that, it's kind of a balancing act of, do I fund everyone now or do I save some money and try and fund people later on? This was a large cycle, I understand that. However, this is kind of what we'll be seeing moving into the future as more and more of these conferences are continuing to go back to in-person that people will need travel awards for that. We've already seen an uptick from last Senate to this current session for the Travel Awards Committee. So, I don't know that it would necessarily incline to go back and re-review applications. I also think re-reviewing applications after they've been declined, I think that opens up a box of problems that you could potentially get into and in letting people kind of, you know, I think once you put your best foot forward the first time, if you didn't get funding, I understand that's difficult, but we can't fund everyone. Sometimes hard decisions have to get made. And unfortunately, some people didn't get funding. I'm sorry, that's time. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you for all those questions. Uh, are there any motions to be made? All right, seeing as there are none, we will move on to the next piece of legislation, 53012. Um, so this one that uh, Theodore pulled up before was the Travel Awards Improvement Act. Um, so if any of the sponsors of this bill would like to uh, present it. 
Um, so there are a number of us. I'll go ahead and go ahead as I put together a lot of the, the, the language here. Um, really, all this does, um, I'd encourage you to read through it if you want to know why we're doing it. The whereas clauses describe everything. Um, basically, there are some policies that aren't very clear that we clarify. Uh, we also adjust for inflation. Um, the current limit for limit, not the minimum, is just the maximum, was $400. This was set many years ago. Just in the past year, air travel has inflated at a rate of about 33% um, and annually. So it's almost, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's crazy to think it's double. Yeah, so any trouble. Um, Gosh, anyway, um, so the, um, this also just clarifies some language, adjusts for inflation and um, changes something about how fund combining works. Um, as is, uh, you can't combine a GPSG travel award with another travel award. And so this now allows you to do that but you have to use all the other funds first. After you use up all the other funds, then you're allowed to tap a travel award and you have to tell the committee about that award when you apply. So if you already have you know, $3,000, the committee can be like, you don't really need this. And so they, they can factor that into their decisions if they so choose. Yeah, Josh, can I, can I uh, add one thing? I, I think it's important too to take a look at that. We're also increasing the amount. Since things have increased in cost, there were several applications alone that we received them you know, prior where the entire amount of the $400 we were giving them was just for the conference registration or the air fees alone. So by increasing it, it allows us to award more money to people. The committee still has the power to award partial funding. We don't have to award the full 800 which is something we've done in the last cycle. So I think this bill is really important to enable travel to try and take more consideration into where people are traveling, how much money do they actually need, and allows us to award more. Thank you both. Are there any questions for either a senator on this? Yes, Ishan. Just wanted to, well, Ishan Fodke, economics. Um, just because we just reviewed the travel bill, and I just noticed that we weren't able to award a lot of people funding. My only thought is if you raise the max that someone could get, you're just, it's gonna lead to less people getting funding. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So I think that's an excellent point, Yushan. This is one that we struggled a lot with over summer discussing awarding more money versus, um, you know, being able to award more. Like I said, that's why I think it's important to note that whilst we can award more money to people, the committee still has the ability to partially award people. So some people might be able to receive 800 specifically for people who are traveling, you know, for instance, to Seattle or traveling uh, internationally. I think it's important to take those things into consideration. I totally understand your point about, you know, if we're awarding more money, less people will get it. I think that's a very fair point. I would then obviously advocate that travel uh, awards should receive more money each and every year so we can then award more people. However, I think the way that the committee works with the partial funding, uh, I think that can alleviate some of the concerns that you might have around awarding more money. Thank you for that question. And I think I saw, was Megan, was your hand up? All right, yes, Kat. Just a really quick question. Can you guys scroll down on the screen to show Appendix C? Because it's not in the version of the link. Thank you. So if I may clarify, uh, Theodore has actually pulled up, um, we received an amendment ahead of time, so that Appendix C change is not currently in the bill, but we are aware that a senator intends to make that amendment. So what you see there, that Appendix C, C-1002 change, um, we, that, that amendment has not been proposed yet, but I understand that perhaps Kendall Winter would like to make this amendment. Oh, Kendall, your hand is raised. Would you like to speak? Sorry, yes. Um... I actually had a question in addition to proposing this amendment, which I sort of flagged earlier. Um, but sorry, this version of the bill wasn't on Heal Life, so I didn't know that this was coming later. But yes, I would like to propose uh, an amendment that inserts the information that you can see there in blue from line 3332 earlier in the bill. Do we hear a second? second? Is the motion friendly or unfriendly? Friendly. Yeah. Because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I believe if it's friendly, we don't need 
to have yeah, thank you any for further debate. Yeah, thank you for the Yeah, we all thank find you, it Nicholas. friendly. Thank you. Um, may I retain speaking privileges to ask my question? Or should I yield in yes, case someone may. else had something? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask about section two, why you're having this be effective October 2022 and not effective for the next um, budget year. Um, that uh, sh shouldn't, yeah, that shouldn't read that. Um, I'll, I'll take a friendly amendment to uh, change that to. Um, so that wait, would be. Sorry. Correction. What, so this is starting with the current travel cycles, how it is written, I believe, currently. We, we want and the is change that to take place in... now. Okay. I'm just wondering because normally when we do um, funding, like budget changes, we usually bump them to the next fiscal year. So I was just wondering if there was any justification beyond like we want to be able to give out more money sooner rather than later. But it sounds yeah, like that. We, we actually covered this in summer governance, but wanted to mm -hmm. run it past the Senate again at this session. So we it was intended to take effect as soon as the year started. And so it's, I see. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We are out of time for questions. Can I uh, motion to extend discussion? Second. Second. Any objections? Okay. We will extend it for. Um, I see Abigail. You have your hand raised. So if we could just leave that as the last question. Yes, thank you. My only consideration would be extending it to the next fiscal year is students who are applying to travel during the spring of 2023 or the spring or the summer of 2023 as well. Uh, so just something else to consider. Not sure I was, was sorry, was that uh, is the, that's just a comment, right? Not a question. Uh, no, it, it is a question. So for students who are applying to travel abroad or for conferences in the spring or the summer of 2023, what sort of provisions would they have? This is forward moving. It's permanent change. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Abigail. Okay. Uh, are there any other motions that would like to be proposed? Or any other questions? All right, we will move on to the next piece of legislation. So 53013, um, uh, appropriations. All right, so this is uh, appropriations from this past month. And if um, I believe Ishan, yes, Ishan, if you would like to. Ishan Podke, Economics. So if you scroll down, we can just go through. We had a few organizations reach out to the application process and request money, spanning between the general appropriations and social appropriations funds. Here, here you'll see a breakdown of what they requested, what we recommended, and some details as to what the money was going to be used for. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Are there any questions for Ishan? Any motions to be proposed? All right, seeing as there are none, we will move on to the next piece of legislation. Thank you, Ishan. Uh, so the next piece is 52014. This is uh, the Wards Codification Act. All right, uh, Theodore, would you like to present this piece of legislation? GPSG has a tiny handful of awards we hand out to individuals that were introduced several years ago and never written into the code. This bill establishes them formally in the code. Thank you, Theodore. Um, any questions for Theodore? Kendall, I see your hand raised. Yeah, hi, Kendall Winter Musicology. I'm just wondering why we're putting this in the code and not in some sort of bylaws. Um, I could probably answer that. So Ryan Collins, the previous president from two years ago, um, this was just a bill that he had written and um, it was supposed to be so that it could be codified so that the process of awarding um, the four awards that we have could be made known by everyone who reads the codes. I'm not sure why or if it should be included in the bylaws. I'm 
I, I don't know if maybe someone else could speak to that, but. Do we even have bylaws? The code effectively operates as the bylaws That's of graduate professional student government. Yeah. Should it though, I guess is my follow-up question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Kat, did you have a question? Uh, I wanted to propose a hopefully friendly amendment. I just noticed a small formatting error or what I think is a formatting error for lines 63 through 69 um, selection process. Uh, is This selection process is formatted differently than for the other awards. So I believe selection process and then later the selection committee should be on separate lines. Uh, would that be right here? Uh, do I need to hit enter again? Do you deem that as a it's friendly, friendly It's friendly, yes. Yeah. Yes, so you would essentially, I think, yeah, hit enter again, and then they're, they're numbered differently um, on the other. Can we, is, is it possible to make a motion to uh, agree to whatever she says and change it typographically later? Yes, I think that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there are, are other things that need to be changed with this, but since this was initially proposed by Ryan, we're just approving it, going to codify it, and then any other amendments can be made afterwards. Yeah, all typographical amendments are friendly if I sponsored it. All right, any other questions for Theodore? Any motions to be proposed? All right, great. So we will move on to the second to last legislation for today, 53015. I think we're doing awesome with time. All right, so this one is the Conway Appointment Act. Um, Michael Conway, are you here? Huzzah! Oh, perfect timing. Sweet, thanks. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, really appreciate being here uh, and honored for the nomination. My name is Michael Conway. I am a 2L at the UNC School of Law here. Um, one of the reasons, I think the primary reason why I applied for the nomination of the Supreme, oh, I got cameras, that's right. Sorry, I'm out of breath, I literally ran here because um, I, you know, got out of class. Good, all right, <laughs> like ran here and the School of Pharmacy is on the other side of campus from the law school, so definitely got my cardio in. Um, and uh, um, so one of the reasons why I, applied for the nomination for the Supreme Court seat is because I really truly believe in a student government. I never got that opportunity in undergrad. My um, undergrad was online and it's very unique to have a student government uh, system. I think, right, not many schools across the country uh, really kind of trust their students to lead uh, the student body. Um, and then I think the, the court itself is important to the adjudication process of students here. Um, and I thoroughly believe in a, in a court of students that adjudicates student decisions. Um, so that's really why I uh, was not, uh, I applied for the nom uh, nomination and got uh, selected. So appreciate your time uh, and look forward to working with all of you. If I can add real quick, my, Michael and I have had an extensive conversation about several hypotheticals where, as you all know, because you're part of this body, we have a whole bunch of stupid rules that make red tape that we just have to deal with. Michael understands how to get us around them and make stuff happen, and that's why I selected him for this position. Recommended to him. Sorry, you guys will decide if we have selected for this position or not. Are there any questions for Michael? Yeah, questions. Yes. Kat Selna, Microbiology and Immunology. Um, so I understand that um, law school is very busy. You have a lot of, you know, a lot that's uh, vying for your time. I guess, um, can you speak to how you will fulfill the commitments of this position uh, and any priorities you have? Yeah, absolutely. I, so one of the things I didn't discuss in my introduction, I apologize about that, prior military tenure uh, experience as an intelligence analyst deployed to a variety of locations working upwards to 18 to 20 hours a day. I'm very familiar with time commitments and strengths and how to balance time. Um, I don't consider the position secondary or ancillary or corollary. I believe it is a priority commensurate with my studies. So how I plan to balance it is outside of a direct conflict like class that I, you know, just can't have to be at class, right? Uh, I plan to give it, uh, I plan to give it all of my free time here. I don't have a lot of extracurricular activities. I'm not on like 
something called Journal, which is integral to law school. I, I chose not to go with that. Um, I do have a secondary job that's a, it's a law clerk position, but it's remote. I don't go anywhere. Uh, and they're very uh, amenable to like school activities. Like, and so they don't even consider, they consider school stuff a priority as well. Um, so my time is free mostly, right? When I'm not in uh, school and uh, I have experience balancing high demand capacity for long hours, if that's what it requires. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other questions at the moment? All right, great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right, so the last piece of legislation we will go over today is 53016. And this is the Budge Budget Amendment Act. And um, if either of the sponsors would like to present this. Uh, right, so I told you, surprise, we have money. Um, we, we are required to keep stuff in reserves, uh, uh, but we have pretty good, I think this is on. Um, we have a pretty good amount that we can spend. We can spend at least 100,000 uh, in addition to the 160 that we automatically receive in fee appropriations. Um, this is a bill to spend uh, 47,000 of that. And as I mentioned earlier, I would like your approval to take 50,000 and endow a fund that would then exist in perpetuity so that when people donate small change to student government, we're eventually turning off actual usable amounts of interest. Um, we have some plans to do a policy expo and things like that where we can try to con very wealthy companies into paying us money to come and talk to you. And then we can use that to pay you guys travel stuff or if you have emergency expenses to pay those and not just you, but your constituents as well. Um, so uh, there are, this is a bill for which I hope you will have some debate because the amount to each category should be up for debate. I have proposed tentative amounts to each of these categories. I encourage you to offer amendments and uh, I'll consider them friendly if they make sense. And if not, then, you know, you can do a hostile takeover. That's possible. Thank you, Theodore. Are there any questions for Theodore at the moment? Any motions to be proposed on this piece of legislation? I, I do have a question. Okay. Sorry, uh, Jamie, I saw your, or Joshua saw your hand. I, I defer to Jamie. I'm Jamie Andrews from Public Administration. Um, so as we were reviewing this bill in the Oversight and Accountability Committee, I noticed the level of funding given to both appropriations and travel awards. And I was curious as to the rationale behind that, whether um, appropriations felt similarly strained as travel awards does, and whether there was some flexibility there. I just want to know more about that. Uh, I'd like to offer a seed speaking time to Ishan, who can give a better answer than I can. I can only speak. So Asian for economics, we're about at our monthly pace right now. We know we're as strained as the travel awards. With that being said, we haven't had to decline anyone for funding, but we've been able to accept what's coming in. And at that rate, we will exhaust our budget by the end of the year. Um, I know last year I also served as a chair. We did have some money left over, but I am open if you want to negotiate this amount. But I do think Theodore also mentioned the endowment fund was also going to be targeted towards travel and the emergency fund, if I remember correctly, but you can correct me if that's wrong. So there should potentially be more money going to something like travel, which is under more of a burden outside of this. So if I may clarify some about that, um, uh, what you see on this bill is one-time allocations. We spend it and then it's gone. The endowment, we will not be spending. It will be turning off interest and then it will be there every year and growing, but it will not be used this year. To, to fund things. Um, so that's up to you guys. If you'd rather spend all our cash now, I will say it takes 50,000 to start an endowment. We're probably never gonna have 50,000 sitting around again because COVID meant we had money left over and somehow it didn't get spent last year. Um, I think either that or someone just put it on our bank account. Either way we have it. Um, so yeah. All right, Nicholas. Yeah, hi, I have a question for you then, Peter. How much money are you proposing we put in the endowment fund and then kind of what can we expect to return on that to be? 50%, uh, um, I, when I talked to Bobby, he was saying, uh, I'm trying to remember what the amount was. Brian, do you remember how much gets turned off from the, um, 
I think they, there's 250,000 sitting around somewhere and it produces 14,000 a year. If anybody can do some napkin math on what that percentage is, I'm sure they put it in pretty safe stuff to generate that money. Yeah. So um, I think it's a, a question worth knowing what all of you think, if it's worth it or not. Okay, 8%. And, and how much are we proposing putting into the endowment? 50,000, okay. the minimum required. Okay. Point of order. Yes, Kendall. Hi, is this really germane to what we're talking about at the moment? Because I believe we're not forming an endowment with this piece of legislation. We are just talking about an allocation from the budget. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. So since we're, you know, on time, I'd like to just make sure that we're talking about things that are germane to the legislation today. Um, and I do Agreed. have a question about the legislation. Um, although we are actually at time, so we will need a motion to expend, extend discussion. Motion to extend. Yeah, seconded. Seconded. Go ahead, Kendall. Uh, could you just tell me how much time we've extended discussion by? I think well, five minutes. Okay, Nicholas shakes his head. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I guess, ask what the justification is for nearly doubling the emergency fund budget. It runs out. Okay. And people um, really like it. It's direct aid, so it makes us look good in ways that I think other times we look like a useless body that doesn't do anything. Yeah, it makes us look good to constituents, but it makes us look bad to people who care about how we utilize our own funds. My understanding is that our board of trustees doesn't like it when we spend money on individuals rather than, or excuse me, student fee money. They don't care if we spend money on individuals. They just don't want student fee money spent on individuals. So by increasing emergency fund and travel awards, we are doing something that flies in the face of what we've been directed not to do from uh, the board of trustees. So I'm just wondering if you could, okay. Um, the rationale is that we're increasing categories that go to all students like appropriations by more than the amount that we're increasing either of those individual aid categories. Um, I, I can also say that at, at UNC Charlotte, they spend 80% of their budget on travel awards. I guess they have a different board of trustees. So we might be able to make a comparative argument there. Um, but your, your point is correct. The board of trustees does not like this. I think 20,000 is, chump change as far as they're concerned and that they probably won't make a big deal. But um, I wonder if Brian, do you have any thing to say about that? I think in terms of, um, sorry, Brian Lackman, GPSG advisor. Um, I think Kendall, it's a great point you bring up. I also think it's important to recognize that costs are going up pretty significantly across the board and obviously needs are increasing. Um, you know, inflation is obviously an issue both locally and nationally. Um, it's part of also the reason why I know Nicholas and company from travel awards try to increase the amount of money providing students given the significant increase of costs. And so I think part of it also is recognizing the need and also that more and more students are constantly tapping into those resources. So very quickly, for yeah. example, the Dean of Students Office who runs the um, all the essentials task force piece and all those things are quickly running out of resources as well too. And so just recognizing grad students are increasing getting asked to pay more. I think part of this is just kind of that intentional thought process and the hope also that by creating So it becomes less of an issue with because at that point, you all are constantly supporting and that a lot of can support. Then trustees really can't be mad about that because that's what you all so handle. Yeah, thanks. I just, uh, to offer some historical context, when I started in the Senate um, four years ago, the emergency fund budget was $2,500. And uh, I'm just trying to point out that this particular line item on the budget has um, increased uh, out of step with increases in other portions of the budget. And that's all I'm trying to, to sort of cap is just that we're raising things sort of in proportion to one another. I understand that, you know, grad students have needs and I want grad students to help grad students, but I want UNC to help grad students more by raising stipends yeah. and by making their emergency fund more accessible so that we can use our um, fund for things like, you know, do, bagels and ga uh, do you, Duke game watch parties and stuff. Do you, do, you, do you have a motion to amend this? 
Sure, I motioned to uh, amend it to a $4,500 increase instead of 9,000. Okay, in the friendliest way possible, I deem this a hostile amendment, so it can go sure. to a vote. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Any objections? Point of order. So um, I don't believe Theodore can't. Um, so the, the we uh, there's not a motion to reject a motion. So you just continue discussing a motion. Um, we'll have someone who anyway. So yes, we will now. We're talking about whether the motion to make the amendment, because Theodore did not consider it friendly, we have to discuss and vote on it. Order. Um, is there a clarification? We're changing it from nine thousand. Oh, sorry, Fernando Quijano from uh, PhD in Business Administration. Um, is there a destination for the decrease in forty five hundred dollars to another line, or are we just discussing removing this without reallocating that difference to another line item? I believe at the moment it's just to reduce the amount to forty five hundred. You would have to queue a subsequent amendment to move it somewhere else. I think at this point. There's an amendment already on the floor. Um, Tim, I am ex uh, allowing you to speak if you would like. Thanks, Tim. Point of order. So I just want to clarify for everyone what we're doing right now. So right now we are now discussing the amendment, um, and then we will we'll vote on whether to adopt this amend amendment or not. Tim. Thanks, Tim Feeney, Epidemiology. Uh, you asked if anyone objected to this, and I object strongly. I think. Reducing the amount of money to emergency funds is very student unfriendly, and I don't really care what the board of trustees thinks. Um, we recently had an issue in the uh, Gilling School where GRAs weren't being paid for months at a time. And so the only relief they could get is from things like the emergency fund. And so it is a pie in the sky wish that the UNC would take over and give us all adequate stipends. But I think this is the one thing that we should be funding more than anything else, even travel awards, because if students need help immediately, where else are they going to get it? So I think this should be the one part of the budget that does increase out of step with the rest of the items. Jamie. Uh, Jamie Andrews, Master of Public Administration. Um, Kendall, would you consider it a friendly amendment to consider moving the 4,500 to travel awards rather than just reducing it? Should we do a friendly amendment in that way? Um, I don't know procedurally if we can amend an amendment. I you can. You can? Okay, cool. Um I personally think that it, it would be hypocritical for me to say that it's okay to spend on individuals in travel awards and not in emergency funds. So um I, I, that's what the discussion's for, I suppose, right? Um, I, I would I would move it to social appropriations or Senate appropriations instead, so we're spending on groups. Nathan, I saw your hand up. Yeah, so Nathan Quinn, English Department. Um, uh, it is my understanding uh, as of this afternoon that we've had to reduce the amount of emergency fund grants because our budget for that has been low. Um, if somebody else has other information, that's... Uh, Jermaine, I think, to this conversation. So I think I think we are like, as Theo said, we're running out of that fund. So that's something that could be noted for this. I guess I, okay. um, Riley. Um, Riley, Public Administration. Um, I just have a question, a clarifying question as to how the GPSG emergency fund is different from the UNC emergency fund. It's administered by different people uh, and there are slightly different criteria like you you need to commit to applying to certain other funds um, uh, Elena do you want to take the technical side yeah um, so I was chair of the emergency fund for two years and if you're referring to the Dean of students fund that typically students get referred to first um, they have certain restrictions that our fund does not have for example they might have changed this recently but at least until recently they were requiring that students had to max out all credit cards and they also take a pretty long process going to 
um, figuring out if they can apply for any loans and financial aid and things like that, where being chair of this fund, um, I can say that a lot of the requests that students had were pretty immediate. Let's say a flooding occurred and they you know, had to get a new fridge or something because um, they couldn't have any food in their house. Or um, you know, there were a lot of like medical things that, yes, I think most of you know, medical procedures and such are a, just an exorbitant price. So those things require sort of emergency um, reimbursement and uh, the Dean of Students Fund does not sort of um, cater to some of those situations. But we do require that students first apply to the Dean of Students Fund and we are actually working with them closely to figure out um, a more streamlined process so that they only get really referred to our fund if they get rejected from the Dean of Students Fund, for example. Okay, and the Dean of Students Fund is still completely separate from the that yes. fund no longer exists. Yeah, we only had a one-time allocation of funds for that COVID relief fund, but that no longer exists. Yeah, thank you. Also, if I may make a point, quick point of order first. Um, so we are presently discussing the amendment to the amendment unless um, Senator Andrews would like to withdraw it. Uh, with, withdrawn. All right, then we are now just discussing the original amendment, which is to remove uh, $4,500 from travel award, from the emergency fund, excuse me. Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Before we do that, can I ask a question? Um, so Nate from Cell Biology, um, do we have any previous data for how our emergency fund spending um, has gone and whether we ever reach or exceed $11,000 per year? And, and also, I guess, if this $9,000 would just roll over for a year that we may exceed $11,000? We, we have spent 100% of it every year. It has never been budgeted this high before. Does that answer your question? Near enough. Okay. Um, Joshua. Yeah, so um, I have a, a comment I wanted to make. Um, so uh, for, for those here who are thinking, we're removing, if we're removing this, this the, part of the discussion here is whether we're investing in long-term by putting more into our endowed fund we'll create later this year, or we're going to allocate it now. We were not aware that the endowed fund was an option when we voted to approve this bill in the Senate Finance Committee. That is a more recent development. Um, and so I wanted to add that context. And so personally, I might see that, well, I don't know, I, you could go either way. Yeah. Uh, Katie Heath from BME, I would just like to note that this is not a permanent increase, correct, in this allocation. Correct. This is a one-time increase with extra funds that we have. So it, it, if we won't have to show this as a, a permanent increase in the amount of money that we're allocating for this. So I, I don't know if that changes people's thoughts on the effect or the impact that this will have on people's opinions of this fund. Um, Kendall? Yeah, Kendall Winter Musicology. Um, it's come to my attention that people in the room aren't necessarily seeing what's happening in the Zoom chat, um, but there's a little bit going on regarding the um, Elena's excellent explanation of the Dean of Students Emergency Fund. Um, uh, a comment was made that those rules about uh, having to access other funds and uh, overextend on credit cards are psychotic. They are. Uh, my point is that we should be pushing for a redesign of those eligibility requirements. And as we continue to raise our funds, they get to sit on their hands and not change anything. Um, and while I fully respect what um, Katie just said about the one-time allocation, uh, we do set precedent by raising uh, these funds year over year. And again, I'll note, I've been here for five years and we've never reduced the amount of the emergency fund. So there is a little bit of bias there with that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Um, just to mention a couple things. So as far as I know from the previous year, the amount that was um, allocated to the Dean of Students Fund was provided by um, some grant. 
I don't know, and that expired last year, so I'm not sure if they uh, got the grant again for this year. Um, but I agree, we, we are, the chair of the emergency fund currently is working with the Dean of Students Fund so that we can try to um, figure out how we can distribute students' needs between both of these funds. But the emergency fund has not decreased over the years because especially with more um, visibility of the fund, we are just getting more and more applicants. The first year, there were not that many applicants. We had plenty of funds remaining for the spring semester, whereas for at least the past two years that I was the chair, we would run out even before the end of the fall semester. Um, so it's in part because of uh, um, just increased visibility, but I think also in result of just increased inflation and things like that. Um, so I just want to make that point, but if I may comment, so the next speaking, we have a lot of questions right now. So the next people speaking will be Lee, then Tim, then Nick, then Fernando, then Brian is the order. Lee. Uh, move the table, the amendments. Is there a second? A point, point of a point of maybe information. Tabling means we still have to resolve it during the meeting. Um, would you like to instead refer this back to the science, the Senate Finance Committee for consideration um, and perhaps referral back to the Senate at our next meeting in November? Point of order. If, if we table that amendment, do we have to table the whole bill or is it just oh. tabling the 4,500? Yeah. Are you sure that tabling it requires readdressing it? If so, that I, can, I'll, I can amend that motion to postpone indefinitely. I think tabling it does not okay. require readdressing it. Tabling does require postponement, does not require that we address it tonight. Uh, motion to postpone indefinitely. Is, is there a second? Second. Seconded. Okay. Can I hear the ayes? Cool. Can I hear the nays? Nay. All right, so the ayes have it, and we will postpone this piece of legislation for now. Uh, no, Correction, just, just the amendment. So we've indefinitely postponed consideration of the amendment. We are now back, still considering the whole bill. Yep. Someone could move. Um, Actually, have just a motion to have the Finance Committee uh, draft up a, um, a statement on that Otis regulation set. Um, nothing specific right now, but just to have us do it in our meeting. So is that a motion to refer this bill to committee? Sorry, motion for the finance committee to uh, consider the Dean of Students Emergency Fund regulation. You know what, just withdraw it. I, I'm not sure that's germane to the current um, bill. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. So just motions for this current amendment. If um, you can mention the finance committee later, Bill, um, yes, for, uh, no, who did you say was next? Uh, Tim, did you still want to speak? I just wanted to follow up with the clarification questions. I'm sorry, so this is, we're talking about money allocated to these different funds or the $50,000 for the endowment. That's, that's the choice? No, they are not mutually okay. exclusive. Okay. Nick, did you have a question? No, that was relating to the previous amendment. Fernando. I motion for this uh, piece of legislation to be referred back to the Finance Committee to come uh, consider it in combination with the endowment uh, to then report to us back again with all of this information uh, that has come to light recently to be considered as a whole. Second. Do I hear the ayes? Aye. Do I hear the nays? <laughs> what? Uh, I think the eyes have it. So, um, so this will be referred to the finance committee. All right. Thank you all for um, the discussion. If if you're quick, I'll I'll let you speak. So yeah. Sorry. My my clarifying question. Um, if we don't pass this budget, what can we still? like give out travel awards and use our money? Wait. Sorry, what was that very last part? Uh, can we still use the money that we have for our current budget trajectory? Yes, this is just, um, we would pass this just to allocate more money to the emergency fund. So we would still use the current 11,000. 
All right, great. So that is all for the legislation. Um, okay, so during um, standing committee updates, we will uh, make live the ballot voting in just a moment. So you can vote while we hear some updates from the standing committees um, and we are nearing the end. So these should go pretty quickly. Um, Ishan, I believe that you are first for the finance committee and I, I did put a slide up for you. Do you have control over this? Oh, sorry. Um, okay, well. She's controlling it from her computer. Just a second. Just a minute. Yeah, finance, go ahead. Okay. Um, so sorry, I actually had finance committee first because I uh, they had an image that they wanted me to put up. So no one else has a slide, so this made it easier um, to have finance committee go up first. Uh, Nathan. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, Nathan Quinn uh, from the English Literature Department. Um, all right. So, hi everyone. Uh, last Monday, the Finance Committee met for the first time this school year. Uh, during our meeting, we formally elected Senator Bikita as the Finance Committee's official replacement representative to the Joint Governance Council, as I have a persistent conflict with Wednesday night sessions. We also uh, looked over it and uh, provisionally uh, gave our stamp of approval to that budget amendment that we just considered. Um, but we're happy to take it back uh, because I agree that we should probably look into the um, endowment situation. Um, do I have a question in the corner over here? Brian Lackland, GPSG advisor. Uh, the graph that you're seeing is actually an inaccurate representation of the amount of money that was discussed and shared. So um, I wanted to see if we could get pulled down because it's actually not a reflection of what was discussed in the meeting or actually what that looks looking for. So. Got it. All right. I mean, you're welcome to pull it down if you'd like. Can you uh, can you give an accurate uh, representation of that uh, number so that we can understand what the actual numbers are? So every single dollar from QAB for programming is open to the entire student body. They have set aside ten thousand additional dollars in addition to all student programming that's open to the entire student body, including all undergrads, grads, and professional students. Only for grad professional students to uh, allocate specifically for funding requests to try and make sure they can be extra supportive for collaborations. So the ten thousand dollars isn't only the money that's going to them. All student programming money goes to all students, but this is in addition to that, a focus for additionally supporting graduate professional students on top of that. No, this is not applied to any kind of under by any means in the same capacity. Understood. Well, I will continue my uh, speech here and then we can we can discuss that in a minute. Um, so, all right, uh, before I continue, um, I would like to motion to uh, establish that uh, committee that Senator Lyman discussed earlier in our, uh, in our meeting to review the university budget. This would be an ad hoc committee uh, to uh, review the university budget in advance of that October 18th meeting that Theo's having with the provost. Uh, so can I um, get a second for that motion? Second. Any objections? That means we have to get volunteers for it now. <laughs> All right, so the motion passes. I guess now we'll take any volunteers if there are any. All right, Noah and Ishan, are you both volunteering? Uh, yes. Awesome, anyone else? No, you may serve concurrently on an ad hoc committee with your existing committee assignment. So even if you're already on another committee, you're welcome to join it. All right, Nathan, anyone else? Can I, uh, point of information? Yes, Jamie. Uh, how many members does the committee need to like work? I believe five per. The code is somewhat ambiguous on ad hoc committees, I believe. Um, so generally five would be a minimum, but we have put many more than that on an ad hoc committee before.
All right, are there any volunteers last call? Okay, great. Um, so we will move on to, I believe the appropriations committee, if Ishan, you would like to. Sorry, I wanted to continue. Yeah, all right, yeah, all right. So before I finish, uh, the finance committee would also like to draw the Senate's attention to a student fee related issue that affects all grad students. This is what we're going back and forth on here. So currently graduate students pay a $13 fee, which goes to the Carolina Union Activities Board to be spent on social events. The aggregate amount of this fee comes out to roughly $150,000, which is almost a third of the Carolina Union Activity Board's total budget. Uh, however, while graduate students uh, contribute a third of Quab's funding, um, Quab specifically allocates, we've heard about $10,000 uh, to events targeted at graduate students. And uh, all of the other um, events that Quab uh, puts on are targeted specifically at the majority of students, um, rather than events which target diverse demographics of students equitably. Uh, and so because the majority of students at the university will always be undergraduates, and because Quab itself is mainly composed of undergraduates, graduate students' interests are often fundamentally misaligned with those of Quab. Um, so there are a few ways that we can potentially address the issue of directing graduate students' funds toward graduate students. Uh, we could ask Quab uh, to potentially restructure into two different boards aimed at the two different constituencies, separating out their funding sources accordingly. Uh, we could also simply increase the volume of requests that go to Quab for graduate programming and see if they're willing to raise the allocation of funds toward graduate events. Or to ensure that this graduate fee money is spent on graduate students, we could direct that money away from Quab into GPSG, which would enable us to greatly expand our funding for graduate focused student outreach, social programming, and professional development by nearly doubling our annual budget. Uh, GPSG would be able to make a big difference uh, with these funds. For example, um, as I've heard from Harsh, uh, we've had to reduce our emergency fund grants uh, to low funds, the number of travel awards we can approve is low, et cetera. Uh, however, this final course of action would require a constitutional referendum and would necessitate, necessitate the active participation and advocacy of this body to secure the necessary votes. So with all that in mind, I will yield my remaining time to take questions, comments, and allow for debate on, on interest in such a referendum. Thank you, Nathan. Brian? I think uh, part of this, I guess I'm un not understanding, is GBSG actually has been bad in managing its funds by having 200,000 extra dollars in funding over the years, and that's not just one time from uh, the COVID experience, that's been over many, many years of misspending. QF actually consistently has actually tried to advertise to get grad students to join, to engage, to be part of the planning process, and almost never does. There was a number of years actually where QF had a series of, uh, of social chairs who were part of GBSG, you actually had space on the board, uh, but the past few years that has gone away. And that was a GPSG decision, not a QF decision. So there's been lots of ways in which Cuba has actually tried to do that consistently over the years and has not been supported by graduate student, professional student government. Additionally, you know, again, having two hundred extra thousand dollars, I think speaks more to GPSG's lack of effective management of its funds over the top, over its time. Obviously not a current representation of the current Senate members present, but in terms of historically as we're trying to support students effectively. And so I'd encourage you all to really consider what it looks like in terms of actually effectively supporting and working with students, also recognizing they've done more programming to support parents, families, kids, any number of programming and things, things at Beatty Hill, all kinds of different programming things have been designed for family programming where GPC typically has not actually had that specific in mind as an example of a population support piece. Thank you, Brian. Joshua? Yeah, so I think my opinion on this matter was very clear in the, the letter that was part of my um, uh, you know uh, platform for President Pro Tempore, but I'd like to include a note that um, this referendum need not be one where we are. It should not be on the issue of whether QAB receives money from graduates or not. Um, really, I think what we, or at least how I could see this going, is a referendum to structure it such that graduate professional student government formally has oversight over how the union, uh, Carolina Union Activities Board, uses its funds. Um, with the idea that if the Carolina Union Activities Board comes forward with events that we think are really great for graduate students, that we would have the ability to actually provide them more funds. But they would have to compete in the competitive process that every organization has right now. We want the, I, I think we want the best events for graduate students. And um, by allowing uh, the funds process to become competitive with other organizations, also partially in alignment with the value, uh, viewpoint neutrality requirements of the Board of Trustees, it could allow um, sort of for QF to even hold better events for graduate students. But if not, those funds would be available for other uh, graduate student organizations. All right, thank you, Joshua. Um, any other questions or comments? Nathan, would you like to say anything further? 
Um, yeah, uh, just to just to wrap up, um, I would say like it is my understanding, uh, and I guess correct me if I'm wrong. A huge portion of PropSQL budget right now goes to homecoming uh, alone. So, and I, I don't know that that's something uh, that uh, grad students are super involved in. And I also will say that multiple avenues of student government have already uh, requested a budget and a, a breakdown of attendance at qual events by graduate and professional student status. Uh, so if we do see from that breakdown that um, a lot of graduate students are going to club events, then I'm sure we'd be happy to like either get rid of this you know idea or take it at a later time. All right, thank you, Nathan. Um, sorry for rushing you before I was moderating the chat, so honestly, I had no idea what was going on. Um, all right, we will move on to updates from our other standing committees. So for appropriations, Ishan, if you would like to provide any update. Sure, Ishan Vodke, economics. Just some two points I wanted to make. If anyone is applying for appropriations, just please make sure when you submit your form that it reads submitted on Hill Life. We had some incidents this week, this past cycle, where people didn't formally finish the su submission process, and there was a bit of confusion back and forth. And secondly, I'll just say, please just look out for the weekly emails. I'll be letting everyone know when our next appropriations meeting will be there. Thank you, Ishan. Any questions for Ishan at the moment? All right, great. We will move on to, uh, so Ely is not here. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to provide any update from the Oversight and Accountability Committee. None is necessarily needed. All right, um, Hillary, if you have any updates uh, for the Rules and Judiciary Committee. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so we had our first meeting this past Saturday, uh, where we reviewed and discussed, um, I think, seven of the legislations that we've um, discussed so far today. Um, we will plan to meet about a week before all the Senate meetings. So uh, we have the recommended legislations to you and for you to review in time uh, for the meetings. And feel free to join us. Um, uh, I, I think I'll notify, uh, I believe, Kat of when our meetings are, so they will be on the calendar uh, accessible to you uh, for the future. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Hillary? All right, thank you. Um, Abigna, if you have any updates from the SOGAPS committee. Hi, yeah, Abigna Rao, um, Health Behavior. Um, so SOGAPS has had two successful committee meetings so far, and we've identified three areas that we'd like to focus on for this semester. Um, one, we are planning to overhaul the town hall social gathering guidelines and resources just to improve accessibility and utility to the senators as they plan their events. Um, we are also drafting an opinion resolution regarding the dean search process, um, and we aim to address lack of faculty and student involvement in the latest graduate school dean search. And finally, we are planning to address transportation and pedestrian safety on campus. So those are the three um, things that we're trying to focus on. Um, if anybody has ideas that they would like to share with the SOGAPS committee, they can always reach out to us, um, and we will do our best to prioritize for the fall or the spring. Um, something else I wanted to share is that our committee is in charge of reviewing opinion resolutions. So if any fellow committee members or senators have legislation that they would like us to review, um, our next meeting is scheduled for October 25th. So if you could send that to me um, by Friday, October 21st, we can make sure to get that on our next agenda. Um, any clarifications, you can email me or just talk to me after. What was the other date? Sorry. Um, so date of meeting is October 25th. Um, date of like due date legislation is October 21st. Thank you. Any questions for Abigna? All right, seeing as there are none, we will go to Nicholas for any additional travel awards <laughs> committee updates. Yep, I would say the only thing is, is that uh, we awarded 2,800. Our current operating budget uh, for the remainder of the term as of right now is a uh, little over $18,000. So um, with that, I would say that's all the updates from travel unless anyone has any questions for me. Thank you, Nicholas. Any um, questions for him at the moment? All right, great. So those are all the updates from the standing committees. Thank you to all the chairs. Um, the last thing that we have, so this is a little out of order. 
Okay, I think I just had a couple announcements. So um, I will provide this uh, afterwards in the email so that you can send to your constituents. But as Theodore mentioned earlier, the town hall. Hey, make a quick point of information. Just want to let everyone know, make sure to vote. We will be closing voting and announcing results very shortly. So um, this is your last you know, warning. Um, so we do have a form where you can submit any questions that you would like us to um, review beforehand and bring up during the meeting. So just would like to let you know, please share that with your constituents um, and some topics that will be included. So this was uh, included in the lovely newsletter that Kat sent out, but just to reiterate, topics will include the new all funds budget. You can see what is currently in that budget by clicking on that link, um, enrollment, hiring trends, and then the fiscal big picture at UNC. So a lot of things will be covered, so please share with your constituents. Um, this is old, okay, this is, this is not the updated PowerPoint. Um, all right, it, does anyone still need to vote? Okay, please do so within the next couple minutes here. Um, if you need help, uh, and you can call me, you know, raise your hand or something. I'll try and run over. All right. This is not the updated PowerPoint should be uploaded on Heal Life. Um, there are some additional announcements there, but you can just look at them, and I will also include them in the follow-up email. Again, in an email template that I that I sent before, um, so that you can share that easily with your constituents. And just one last thing before we um, go over the results of the ballot voting, before you leave, please take, um, I made vegan chocolate chip cookie things. So if everyone would like one, there are tons there. Um, vegan meaning the chocolate chips are whatever you need to, it has oat milk, so um, they're good. So please take one. <laughs> Does anyone still need to vote? While we're waiting, does anyone have any general questions about anything? So um, something I'll add here is an announcement. We've created name placards for all senators. That's all these papers up here. I noticed a, a number of you were able to grab them. Um, just so we don't get any lost, we'll go ahead and keep those between the meetings. And then when you arrive and sign in each week, um, you can go ahead and grab your name placard. They're just card stocks. You have to fold them. Um, yeah, so if there are any errors on it, go ahead and just write the correction on it and we'll print out a new one. If you have a logo you'd like added um, on the side, uh, go ahead, I'll, I'll send out a form for that and you'll be able to submit that. Voting. My follow up share all. And is there a motion? Second. <laughs> is there a Second. motion to adjourn the meeting? Objection. Objections? Adjourned at uh, 7.31 p.m.